Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, October 29th, 2023. It focuses on Jesus' command to love our enemies and do good to those who hate us. The message to all who will listen is, we can show mercy because God has shown us mercy. Now, here is Pastor Mike Neifert. It's so great to be able to share with you this morning from God's Word. I trust that God is going to work through His Spirit to speak directly to you and to encourage you as you serve Him. Let's pray together and invite the Spirit to do His work. God, thank you that you are in this place and that you have brought us together as a church to worship you, which we've done, and to hear your word and to be changed by your Spirit's work through it. And I pray, God, this morning that you would accomplish your purposes in each of us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in the early 1950s, comedian Joey Adams hosted the game show Rate Your Mate. Any of you ever seen that? Sounds kind of sketchy. Anyway, he said a lot of interesting things. Here's a small sampling of his on-screen witticisms. Marriage is give and take. You'd better give it to her or she'll take it anyway. A psychiatrist asks a lot of expensive questions your wife asks for nothing. Never let a fool kiss you or a kiss fool you. (laughs) He said something else as well. Not sure if this one was from Rate Your Mate or perhaps from a comedy gig he did elsewhere. I don't know the context, but here's the statement. With friends like that, who needs enemies? Sounds like something Vito Corleone might have said to his son Michael, whom the elder hoped would take over the family business upon his death. He said, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Good advice, I suppose, if you're a mafia don whose enemies might murder you or a loved one, you'd better know what your rivals are up to and where they are. The compiler of the Bible's book of Proverbs shared a few bits of wisdom about how to deal with enemies in a godly way. Here, again, is a sampling Proverbs 24, 17 to 18 warns, Do not gloat when your enemy falls. When they stumble, do not let your heart rejoice, or the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from them. A chapter later, Proverbs 25, 21, and 22 offers this. If it sounds familiar, it's because Paul quotes these words in Romans 12. If your enemy is hungry... Give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Forty verses deeper in, Proverbs 27, 6 adds, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. I find it interesting that many of these quips and quotes talk about friends and enemies in the same sentence, like they're opposites of the same coin. The wise sayings from the proverb suggest, I suppose, ways to flip the coin. Abraham Lincoln, who had plenty of detractors, once said something close to what the Bible's wise men said. Do I not destroy my enemies when I make them? my friends. Let's get to Jesus' words about enemies now. They're found in Luke 6, 27 to 36. A quick reminder, we're moving slowly through a small grouping of Jesus' teachings, which are strongly related to what Matthew pulled together in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke, these words were said to have been spoken on the plains after Jesus came down from a mountain with his newly appointed apostles. Don't freak out when the Gospels give different locations for similar teachings. What Jesus said is more important than where he said it. It's likely Jesus, living in an oral learning culture, said the same things over and over so his disciples and the crowds could more readily 
remember them. Let's read what Luke gives us concerning enemies in Luke 6, 27 to 36. Follow along. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Love your enemies. Sounds fun, right? No way. Nobody wants to hear this from Jesus. His words are shocking. The wisdom of the day, it seems, was far from this. In Matthew's compilation of Jesus' teaching, we get a hint as to what the prevailing attitude was concerning the treatment of enemies. Hear Jesus' words as Matthew presents them in Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Admit it. This is more in line with what your gut tells you. It makes way more sense than what Jesus is proposing. Love is for all the nice people. It's what they've earned by the, their kindness. Hate, that's what the meanies deserve for being so mean. Taylor Swift's song, Mean, addresses her detractors. I bet you never thought I'd quote Taylor Swift. Here's her words. And I can see you years from now in a bar talking over a football game with that same big loud opinion, but no one's listening. Washed up and ranting about the same old bitter things, drunk and grumbling on about how I can't sing, but all you are is mean. All you are is mean and a liar and pathetic and alone in life and mean and mean and mean and mean. And all the Swifties shout, take that, you dummies reveling in the verbal vengeance that their heroine, their goddess, their tailor is exacting on those who doubt her value as an entertainer. What we want to do with to our enemies is put them in their place, like Taylor or Dirty Harry or Inigo Matoyo. If you've seen The Princess Bride once or twice or three times or more like I have, you know Inigo's long-rehearsed words to the six-fingered man when the two finally meet. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Can I say something that's been on my mind for quite a long time concerning the heroes we worship in pop culture? We love those who get back at those who've hurt them. We consider strong those whose hatred drives them to destroy their arch nemesis. We, and I'm talking to you all as believers now, should be careful when we watch such gruesome fare. We should take care that we don't get drawn into the worldview which thinks revenge is the best solution. We should step back and think, because clearly this is not a Jesus-like attitude. Our king, Jesus, says, love your enemies, then proceeds to tell us how we do that. What he says is practical and hard. Look at how he starts in verses 27 and 28. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. What crazy ways to retaliate when harm's been done. These things go beyond tolerance toward the idiot who did you wrong, beyond ignoring him or avoiding her. Jesus' ideas of the best thing to do is to do good, to actively do something great or kind to the person who treated you unkindly, who treated you badly. It's to bless, to pray. 
Catherine McNeil penned an article for the Missio Alliance on this topic last year. Entitled, What Does Loving Your Enemies Look Like in 2022? The article began with this story from the author's childhood. I was a very earnest child. Jesus said, love your enemy, and I was determined to give it a try. But how? The practical steps were fuzzy. Who even was my enemy? I dug through the stacks of Christian books and magazines provided by my parents in the church, discovering steps to assurance of heaven and how to lay out the Romans' road to a friend, but little or no practical points on loving one's enemy. Eventually, I found it. A children's magazine arrived in the mail, and one of the devotional readings described how to respond to bullies in a Christ-like way. Surely this was it. The devotional suggested that when a bully insults me, for example, saying my sweater looks ugly, I should respond not by defending myself or paying them back with a similar insult, but by agreeing. Then I should offer a compliment to the bully that turned the insult upside down. For example, I guess this sweater is ugly, but I think your shirt is so pretty. I read through the piece several times, ensuring I was ready to try it at the next opportunity. Just a few days later, when my classmates and I were taking off our shoes and socks to play in the sandbox at school, one of the girls pointed to my feet and said, Your feet are so little. To me, this was the height of insults. I was small for my age, a situation that proved humiliating on a daily basis. I knew what to do. I guess you're right, I said bravely. My feet are small, but I think your feet are super huge. (laughs) The rest of the interaction, she concludes, did not go the way I had hoped. Such a great story. It gives guidance and acts as a reminder to us. Obeying Jesus doesn't always lead to perfect results in the here and now. The results we want may not come till we're resurrected and living with Jesus forever in his perfect, recreated new heavens and new earth. That's when we're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. When I hear these words, I'm reminded of my need to not only forgive the man who abused me when I was a teen, but to go beyond forgiveness and pray for him. God, save him from his sin. Rescue him from his bent toward evil. I pray this way every time God brings him to mind. I pray in hopes that he will repent. I pray knowing if he resists God and continues to harm others, God will avenge the wrongs done. Justice will be served in eternity. Back to Jesus' words in Luke 6. You notice Jesus gave several ideas of how to live out what he's ordering. His examples involve being slapped, being stolen from, being taken advantage of. Our hearts rebel against what he says is the best path, but still his way is the way even if it's uncomfortable. At the end of this part of Jesus' speech to the people on the plane, he says something interesting about God, which helps us understand why we're to be merciful toward our enemies, why we're to do good when bad's been done to us. Look again at verses 35 to 36. But love your enemies, do good to them, he's repeating himself, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, Because he, that is God, is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. What does Jesus say about God? Jesus says God is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Jesus says God is merciful. The hope we have of being saved is grounded in these truths. If God is not kind to the ungrateful and wicked, if he's not merciful, we're doomed. We are or were among the ungrateful and wicked. God had mercy on us when we believed in Jesus. How can we not in turn show mercy toward those who are ungrateful and wicked toward us? There's a parable about being merciful, Jesus told, which doesn't find its way into Luke or Mark or John. It's only found in chapter 18 of Matthew. And it comes on the heels of Jesus' words about how to deal with conflict among brothers and sisters in the church. Listen to the parable of the unmerciful servant and know that Jesus told it to warn people of his day and to caution you. Here we go. Matthew 18, 23 to 35. 
Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. How many of you have been shown mercy by God? Any of you who've done anything against God's moral law, any of you who've fallen short of his holy standards, any of you who've failed to love God and love neighbor, you've received mercy. You've been forgiven. This parable and what we've heard Jesus say in Luke 6 call on you to pass along what you've been given. Isn't that how you read it? You have received abundant mercy from the Father. You have been shown mercy by God for sins you know you've committed and for transgressions you're clueless about. You've had sinful thoughts blotted out and wicked actions atoned for. You've received grace upon grace upon grace from God. Amen? You know it's true and you thank God for his mercy towards you. Don't you? You do so regularly, and you forgive men promptly, even when they don't ask for grace, even when they don't deserve it. Grudges against the women in your life don't linger long in your heart. God's love for you, his grace toward you, his mercy prompts love and grace and mercy toward all those who've wronged you, whether the slight was minor or it was major. Immediately after he refers to what he calls the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, James in James 2, 12, and 13 says something interesting along the lines of what we've been talking about. Listen to what he writes. This is James 2, 12 to 13. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Hear God's word to you today. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Showing mercy is always better than showing annoyance or disdain or superiority. Love your enemies is being merciful. I think it's safe to say Jesus was thinking along these lines as he moves on to the next topic in Luke chapter 6. Listen to what he says in verses 37 to 42 after all this talk about loving enemies and doing good to those who hate you. Verse 37, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do you hear echoes of Jesus' love your enemies and do good to those who hate you message in these words? There's a link, I think. If you love your enemies or your neighbor or your brother or your sister, you will not judge them in a harsh way. 
You will recognize your own tendency towards sin and gently deal with those around you who have the same failings. We're all in need of the spirits and each other's help. Remembering that the chapter breaks were inventions of men and sometimes chop up blocks of thought unnecessarily, I want you to listen to what Paul wrote in Galatians 5, 22 through 6, 5. I think you'll see how the work of the Spirit in your life produces fruit and how the Spirit can keep you from judgmental attitudes as you help sinning brothers and sisters. Listen as I read Galatians 5, 22 to 6, 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Do you see how being ruled by the Spirit leads to peace among brothers? Do you see how his gentleness leads you to be kind to a sinning sister? Do you see how allowing him to judge you gives you grace to not compare yourself to them? This is the kind of judging Jesus commands us to shun. He commands the kind of discernment which helps others overcome sin. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Over judgment of enemies, over judgment of brothers, over judgment of sisters, over judgment of neighbors. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God grant all of us grace for our sins. God grant all of us the power to say no to judgment and yes to mercy. God grant us favor with our enemies so that they can become friends instead. You've got plenty to pray about this morning. Go to God about your own sins, about your tendency to judge, about your lack of mercy and grace in moments of crisis, and thank God for his grace and mercy. Ask him to change your heart so that you can gently help others who are sinning. Respond to God in the minutes of silence, which will follow my prayer. God bless you as you listen. God, thank you for your word. I thank you that you've called us to a life of mercy, to a life of loving our enemies and blessing those and doing good to those who hate us and hurt us. God, help us to forgive. Help us to show grace. Help us to live a life of mercy toward others. God, I pray that you would speak clearly to each person as they listen. Listen to your spirit. God, thank you for your mercy toward me. Thank you for your grace toward me when I'm ungrateful, even after I've acted wickedly when I rebel. God, help us. Help us to hear you. Help us to obey you throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.